Randomness in biology. So biology, as any natural science, uh, is about trying to understand nature, uh, the biological uh, part of nature, in terms of organisms uh, in their various forms and diversity, how they have come to be, how they are changing, how they are interacting with the environment. Uh, and so these, uh, as, as scientists, we, just, we try to uncover what are the natural laws that govern uh, the different mechanisms and processes that are happening in biology. And uh, many of these laws are actually include randomness as part of the law. And that randomness is what introduces uh, the aspect of unpredictability uh, that allows for the diversity and for nature to be ready for any change in the environment, to be able to adapt uh, and move forward for the survival of whatever species or organism going forward on this earth. So randomness is about that unpredictability in nature that allows for it to survive uh, within the environment. So for example, if you have a population of uh, trees in a particular field and there's change in the environment, for example, there's an increase in temperature, if all the trees are identical, then all of them will die if the temperature changes suddenly. However, because of the randomness, not every tree is not identical to the next tree. There's that diversity. So if the temperature changes, not all the trees will die. There will be a few members who do not die because of that randomness, and they will survive and produce seeds for the next generation. And therefore, this species of trees will survive going forward and therefore adapt to the changing environment. So as a Muslim, uh, I believe that there is a God and that he uh, started the, the everything in the beginning. And creator in that sense means that he put down the laws, the natural laws, whether they're the physical laws, gravity, relativity, quantum mechanics, or the natural laws in terms of biology, natural selection, and adaptability, uh, which also include that element of randomness. Uh, and then the universe set forth obeying those laws uh, and evolved and went forward. Uh, so to me, God is the creator in that sense. He does not interfere in every minute. He is outside of time. And therefore, this concept of before and happening now and later does not exist for him because he is beyond dimension. But it exists for us, and therefore sometimes we find a difficulty in, in um, asso associating a God creator with what's going on today. But in, in the way I see it, God the creator, in the sense that he created the laws, and then nature unfolds obeying those laws. For God, the concept of God intervening as life or the universe unfolds and progresses and evolves uh, only exists uh, as a concept if we are trapped in time. But if we can imagine that God is outside the dimensions of time, uh, then he's never intervening in that sense, and he's always intervening as well because he's outside of time. Uh, so within time, to me, he's not intervening because he's outside of time. I'm a biologist, and as a biologist, I, I make observations around me to try to understand what are the natural laws that govern how different organisms have evolved uh, in the past and now and in the future. Uh, so using my logic, the laws of evolution, natural selection, uh, seem to make the most sense to explain these phenomena. As a Muslim, uh, looking back at the uh, Islamic civilization, which was actually uh, very important in the development of the different fields of science, medicine, physics, and biology, we see uh, in many uh, scholars' writings as early as 8th century, uh, scholars who have pointed to uh, different um, mechanisms governing evolution of different species. Rudimentary concepts that may look similar to Darwin's natural selection, but still the concept that one organism could evolve from ancient ancestors was present in the scholarly works. And this was never, ever a point of contention between religion, as in, in, in this example, Islam, and, and science. And these scholars actually evolved, and so we have 8th century Jahil, we have 10th century Ikhwan al-Safa, we even have al uh, in the 12th century. And all these scholars pointed to different um, concepts that are similar to evolution. And there was never a contention. Uh, and then Darwin came along, uh, and the, the, um, the, appar appar no, the apparent contradiction between Islam as a religion and science 
as a concept only appeared in the uh, early 20th century. And this came because the, there's multiple reasons, but one of the most important reasons is, uh, first, it was the demise uh, of the Islamic civilization, so people were less educated and there was a lot of ignorance. But more importantly, uh, colonialism was rampant. And with colonialism, people used Darwin and social Darwinism as an excuse for colonizing and racism and imperialism. And so in the psychology of the people who were colonized, there was an association between Darwin and colonizing and oppression and, and with ignorance and not having enough scientists in the 20th century in the Islamic world, um, there became this kind of like um, contention between uh, evolution and Islam. Although in our history, it never existed. And now today, this is being reclaimed uh, and reinterpreted and redefined to remove that contention that only came temporary. Uh, another uh, very important point is also terminology. Uh, because many of the studies that were done to try to understand the concept of creator and evolution came from the Western world. And so the word creator in a Western context has a different meaning than it does in the Islamic context. In Islam, when we say God is the creator, it means that he created the laws and the, and the rules and they started unfolding later. And it doesn't necessarily mean that everything was done spontaneously. So when you ask a Muslim, do you believe in creation or creator, they will say yes, because they're talking about a God who started everything. But in a Western context, if you ask, uh, do you believe in God as a creator, it assumes that he is intervening at every minute, creating something spontaneously. So I think that also terminology and how we define creator across cultures and languages sometimes plays a role in, in uh, misunderstandings. In general, I see Islam uh, and religion uh, as a guide on how to live our lives as human beings with other fellow human beings and the environment around us, uh, the ethics, the values that we need to uphold and how we do that. And, and I see also Islam and religion telling us how to use our minds and celebrate them by making observations around us and trying to understand and dissect what are the laws that uh, govern uh, the, the uh, different processes of nature around us in a way to discover God and discover our role in life and in, 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 on earth. Now, therefore, I don't see the Quran or any, uh, let's say, holy text as um, a scientific book where I will have to find, I don't see that I have to find every a natural law explained in the Quran. The Quran tells me how to think. In a way, it explains the scientific method. There are many verses that talk about observation, reflection, thinking, trying to find an explanation, and then observing again, thinking, reflecting. So to me, that's the, that's the scientific method. You observe, you think of a hypothesis, an explanation, you test it, doesn't work, you go back again. Uh, so within this context, that's how I look at the Qur'an. Now, having said that, a lot of people come and will bring verses from the Qur'an trying to dispute, uh, for example, evolution, or on trying to find evidence for evolution in the Qur'an. Again, I try to resist um, uh, fo following that path, because even if I find a verse that proves evolution today, or any scientific concept for that matter, maybe science advances. And then in the future, whatever uh, evidence I used from the Qur'an to prove a scientific uh, concept will change. Because, you know, as scientists, we always have to be skeptical. We say, this is what we believe is the right explanation today, but that may change tomorrow. Now, having said that, if somebody really pushes me to find evidence in the Qur'an to support uh, the concept of evolution, yes, I can find verses where uh, it says that God created uh, human beings or God created different organisms as the most fit. So again, it is how you interpret or explain the word. The Arabic language, which is the language of the Quran, is very, very rich. So any word could have maybe 80 synonyms of what it could mean. And, and this uh, multiple synonyms is what allows for the diversity of trying to understand or explain a verse from the Quran in context of what we know today. So one of those verses says God created human beings uh, or God created organisms to be the most fit. And this to me is so elegant and so beautiful and actually speaks to evolution, it, that uh, organisms evolve to be the most fit for their environment uh, and not necessarily to be the best. So the, the difference between most fit and the best is how you interpret the word in Arabic, which in this context is ahsan. So the word ahsan could mean the best 
and it also could mean the most fit. So that's an example. But again, I don't like to uh, go down that path because uh, to me the, the, the role of the Qur'an is about how to live with my fellow human beings, my environment, how to um, uh, conduct myself, uh, uh, what are the values and the ethics that govern these relationships.